Welcome, everybody. My name is David Gewertz for ZDNet, and today we are doing Better Know a Blogger. I am thrilled to introduce Stephen J. Vaughn Nichols, who is one of my favorite all-time bloggers and, and a role model, in fact. And uh, as everybody, I'm sure, on ZDNet knows, Stephen writes some amazing stuff. Today, our goal is to actually get to know so. Stephen and not just his writing, because we've all read all of his, his writing. But who is, if you think of the man, the myth, and the legend, we know the myth and the legend, who is the man? Uh -huh. So uh, why, don't we, why don't we get started with um, NASA? Because you know Falcon Heavy has just taken off, and I know... Tell us about your background. I know you worked at NASA. Tell me whether you think Elon Musk's Roadster is exciting and how you got from where you started to NASA and then to uh, what you're doing now. Well, uh, first, I'm really excited with what Elon is doing. I think it's great and wonderful stuff. I want a Tesla to call my own. I just can't justify the 120 <laughs> grand it would take to get the one I want, but maybe someday. And I really like what he's doing with space because uh, for the longest time, space has been, uh, we've run it on a shoestring. And actually, even back when I worked at NASA back in the 1980s, it was also uh, being held together with duct tape and bailing wire. Uh, among other things I did at NASA was I uh, kept track of all the uh, data communication circuits that we use for telemetry and for voice on the uh, shuttle flights. And we were using stuff that dated from the 1950s. I mean, admittedly, it wasn't top of the line, but it was still territory circuits, and we were still having to check them for every mission to make sure that that telex line, all 110 bits per second, and went to the Bermuda tracking station was still working. So it's nice to see someone putting serious money and serious tech together to revitalize the space program. Um, if I wasn't a happy technology journalist, I would be knocking on Elon's door and saying, hi there, <laughs> I can explain this technology to ordinary people. Uh, and uh, that would, please hire me, hire me now. <laughs> Uh, so, so can you explain? The, can you explain the Roadster being launched into space? Well, uh, you know, I've heard some people complain about that, saying, "Oh, it's a waste of money." And, and I want to just say, get over it. Come on, it was a test flight. You know what happens on most rocket test flights? They go first test flights. They go kaboom. So you wanted to have something on there that you could go kaboom and people would go damn that's that's a real shame but it's not like you know we just lost 150 million dollars communication satellite or something so uh i think it's really cool and i think it's the uh best uh pr stunt uh i've ever seen in for space and uh and i have every hope that if I can't go and take a selfie with it uh, in a few years because I'll be too old, maybe my kids, my grandsons will be able to take a selfie with it as they go on a Tesla-powered uh, rocket to the Mars colony. I hope so anyway. Yeah, definitely. So you have a wide range of expertise. Now, you, you're, you're writing for ZDNet. Who right. else are you writing for, and, and uh, what, are there, what, what are the other components of, of how you make your living? Is it all writing? Uh, these, well, it's about 90% writing. Uh, besides ZDNet, I still have a regular column over at Computer World uh, where I'm free to talk about anything that I want, and I often do. Uh, and a variety of other places. Uh, I do. Uh, I don't do white papers per se. Well, actually, that's not quite true. I do some white papers still, but I do a lot of uh, what a technology is and how does it really work and what is it good for anyway for a variety of companies. I don't do marketing or public relations. I'd be lousy at it anyway. But if some company wants someone to explain, oh, I don't know, how IB, IPv6 really works or uh, how to put together a 
Kubernetes uh, set up for your miniature cloud so you can expand it on to your public cloud. Hi, I'm your guy. And uh, I also do a little expert witness work, but I haven't been doing much of that lately. Got but it. And when it's expert witness, it's again, it's technology, usually for technologies that people have forgotten are st we're still out there, but the law cases last forever. So they call me in and have me give my two cents on what, oh, I don't know, what x86 chips were like in the 90s, for example. Wow, that's kind of interesting. So yeah. um, what were x86 chips like in the 90s? Let's actually, <laughs> let's actually just, just for a second, because this is, this is, this is ties. I, I recently did an article on um, the iMac Pro versus the original, the original 128K Mac. So yep. what, just in terms of today's processor technology versus x86 mm -hmm. chips in the 90s, what are we talking about in terms of, of change of technology? And, and does, has it surprised you that, that that technology has changed at the pace that it's changed? Uh, not when it comes to chips. Uh, we, we're finally coming to the end of Moore's Law, but uh, really we're still, until recently, we've been right on track with it. Uh, Spectre and Meltdown, since they're based on a technology that people have been using in all the chip manufacturers for the last decade or so to uh, speed chips up, that's going to knock things around some because our performance will go down uh, until the next generation of chips comes along anyway. But uh, no, all in all, we're, we're pretty much right where we should be as far as performance is concerned. I will say that it's amazing, and every time that I, I think everyone who uses computers a lot has had this experience. You are using a new computer, then something goes wrong, or it's just not available, and you have to go to an old computer. And that old computer that even like two years ago you thought was so fast and so cool, and now it is so slow, mm -hmm. and it is just miserable. And you're thinking, you know, what happened? And what's happened is you've gotten used to the new speed and power. Yeah. So do you think, um, I mean, you've been studying um, Spectra and Meltdown a lot. Are yeah. we safe using the current generation of chips, or should we throw everything out and get started with something new? Um, where where are we in terms of, of our safety level with these things? Well, I think we're relatively safe. There are, no one has successfully, to the best of my knowledge, put together a complete um, malware package. But there, you know, you can see the pieces, the holes being explored and expanded on. I'm not too worried about it. Um, what I'm really concerned with now is we are going to, we're just having performance problems and, uh, the fix, the problems really are at a fundamental level. I mean, Intel and can introduce new microcode and the operating system peoples can do their best to program around it. But the bottom line is the only real fix for this stuff is a new generation of chips for everybody. And we're talking, we're going to be living with this problem in the background, hovering there like a dark cloud for at least 10 years, if not longer. So does that mean uh, basically we're all screwed or is it just, you know, business as usual? Uh, well, when it comes to security, we're always kind of screwed <laughs> because we do such a lousy yeah, job. Yeah. Uh, anyone listening out there, a, B, C, D, E, F, G is not an acceptable password. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. or neither is password. That's not acceptable either. And, you know, we've been saying this for decades, and people still do that. And uh, this is sort of a more fundamental problem than that because this, well, human stupidity is very fundamental. <laughs> but now we've got stupidity built into our chips as well, which is annoying, but... Uh, I'm not too worried about this, but I am concerned about it. Um, we'll see. It's uh, I don't think anticipate any massive problems uh, security-wise, but I can certainly see some real trouble occasionally popping out there for some people, like um, oh, cloud servers. I think 
uh, can get some really nasty performance problems there, uh, depending on um, just how well good a job we do fixing it. And again, we can we can only you know going back to NASA, duct tape and bailing wire. Well, we're going to be fixing our chips with uh, duct tape, microcode uh, fix patches, and uh, bailing wire programming code improvements. Probably so. So yeah. take me through um, a typical day's workflow for you. You get up in the morning. Well, how do you manage your day? I mean, in, in terms of getting to know a blogger, one of the things that I find most interesting and, and I know others have asked me about is right. how do you manage your work day, um, especially since you're working from home? So what's your process yeah. for the day? Uh, well, you know, get up in the morning, walk the dog. Uh, I actually do a lot of walking with him. It helps me get away from the desk because otherwise I'm here uh, 10 or 12 hours a day. Um, so that's it's handy to have a reason to move away from the desk. And uh, then uh, I usually start with just checking email and social networks because I get all hundreds of emails every day, which I need to at least glance at. Uh, admittedly, I zap the vast majority of them after just that glance, but still it takes an amazing amount of time just to get rid of spam and junk. And uh, I'm very active on social networks, so I go through those. And uh, then I, I'm also just I'm constantly reading news. Uh, I'm also on a lot of technical mailing lists. So, um, I, you know, for example, I look through the Linux kernel mailing list to see if there's anything jumps out at me there, um, a variety of other news sources. And then I either pick whatever it is I'm going to write about that given day or I start on a project that I've already started. A lot of what I do uh, really is I just start at the beginning of the day and uh, by the end of the day I've turned in a story and uh, then I usually have time to do something else in there, uh, either something, a very short piece or I work on a longer piece that I'm sort of doing day by day. But uh, I am very much driven sort of by whatever the news cycle is. And uh, and fortunately, I, again, I uh, thanks to my uh, academic background in the liberal arts, I learned how to read deeply and quickly, how to uh, write uh, quickly. Occasionally, I write well, too, but quickly, I am always good at and uh, how to do the how to research like a madman. Uh, actually, my very first business was uh, doing research uh, at a university, and uh, I was one of the first people to have access to the early online databases like OCLC and NASA Recon, and the very first version of Dialog. And I, I turned that into my first business, and uh, I'm still using all those skills today. So is that how you went from a uh, uh, liberal arts major to uh, ZDNet and, com and Computer World? Uh, sort of. You know, I, I, I did that. Then at NASA, um, like, I found out and they found out sort of simultaneously that I was really good at technology. It's not that I've ever really studied it. I'm just one of those people with that gift. Give me code. And unless it's assembly, I'll figure it out quickly. And for that matter, my first language, God help us all, was IBM 360 Assembler. Oh, so yeah, Val. Yeah, use <laughs> Assembler as your first language. It is not a good idea. Yeah. Gives you a really deep understanding of what's going on at the hardware level, but you don't want to go there. You really don't. But uh, anyway, I'm just one of those people. I have a knack for it. I picked it up. And uh, it's always doing computer work. And then I discovered that uh, while I was pretty good at that and particularly good at network and system administration, I was uh, even better at explaining in English how that worked to uh, people who were not technical at all. And I thought to myself, I wonder if there's a career here. I wonder if there's something I could do for a living. And... Uh, Turns out I was right, and about 30 years later, here I am talking you to you. And, uh, yeah. 
So you're talking to me on, on a Linux box, and, and one right. of your areas of, of domain expertise is Linux. Right. Um, before we go back, uh, actually, I was going to ask you about Linux, but I want to ask you about what are your domains of expertise in terms of um, what you cover, what you discuss, mm -hmm. um, uh, ranging from technology to other things, but what, what are your professional domains of expertise? Uh, well, Unix before Linux, uh, I should put in there. Also, just operating systems in general. Uh, I've worked with more operating systems than you can shake a stick at, starting with the mainframe operating systems to the uh, things like VMS and so on, as well as both System 5 Unix and BSD Unix, which I know lost a lot of the audience right there. Look it up. <laughs> That brings and, me back, I got to tell you. Yep, and uh, so a lot of work for operating systems of all sorts. Uh, again, mostly Linux of late. And uh, I also do networking still. Um, you know, I cut my teeth on networking back in the day, and I still know a fair amount about that. Uh, don't write a lot about it, but I write about related things like web browsers and so on that depend on the networks. Uh, I also write a lot about the history of technology because I, I was present for a large part of it. Um, and uh, one of my few claims to fame is I'm the first person to write a popular article about this thing called the web. And uh, which, you know, it was, it's nice to know that I, I was caught that one early. That one never took off, did it? No, I never did. <laughs> you know, the funny thing, though, is in that first article, I also wrote about something called Waze, Wide Area Information System, which mm -hmm. nobody knows about anymore. But uh, it really was the first search engine. Uh, I'll respect the Gopher and Archie and all those other earlier things. But Waze was the first thing that put together sort of a real search engine for everything and anything on what was then just the Internet because the web was just coming along. So as I like to say, well, you know, I, I thought the search engine would be more important. And I guess Google would agree that maybe I did get it right after all. There you go. Uh, so so uh, is is your choice of using uh, – mo your, most of your systems are, are Linux based. Is that a yeah. – an anti-Microsoft stance? Is that a preference technologically? Is it easier, cheaper, better? What's What What uh, brings you to Linux as your daily driver? Uh, it's a technology preference. Uh, again, I've, I've done operating systems from, you know, well before there was Windows or in, uh, barely MS-DOS for that matter. Actually, CPM80 was still the system of the day when I came on board. Uh, micro PCs. There's, a, there's also a phrase that takes you back, micro PCs, mm -hmm. rather than PCs. Uh, and it's always it's just worked better. As I'm very fond of saying about Microsoft, whenever they do something right, I'll be happy to say so. It's just that for many years, though, I, you know, I couldn't because um, their operating systems were really pretty darn junky there. Um, they still have problems on the PC operating systems. You know, that said, I will also say Microsoft is doing some really remarkably good things on the cloud now with Azure. And uh, so, you know, Microsoft has learned how to do things right. And uh, which really bugs, I know, a lot of my Linux readers because they still want, you know, Microsoft to be the great black demon, the beast that's going to destroy them all. And, you know, now Steve Ballmer now, you know, he's now uh, wrecking um, the uh, his LA NBA team. So he doesn't have anything to do with Microsoft anymore. So uh, why don't you let me know, say, five things that Microsoft is doing really right now that would have surprised you, let's say, three or four years ago? Well, even three or four years ago, I saw them moving to open source. So that really doesn't surprise me. But that said, I think it's well worth noting that open uh, that it's not so much five things. I mean, there's a whole thing, a variety of things, but it all comes down to Microsoft is truly embracing open source. And that is not embracing to ex extend and extinguish open source. They actually are using it because they have figured out that, guess what? Open source is a really great methodology for developing software. It's the best one out there. Um, and uh, if you don't believe me, just turn and look at your web, uh, go to your web, uh, your web browser and play around 
And uh, probably in the first 10 minutes of going to places like Facebook and Google and Twitter or Yahoo or YouTube or Netflix, you name it, guess what? All of those run on Linux. Most of them use a large number of open source components to it. I mean, the world runs really now on open source and Linux. Uh, one thing that sort of surprises me about Microsoft, though, is Microsoft is now willing to admit that it's not just that they're using open source for their own purposes. Well, of course, they're using it for their own purposes, their business. You, you don't use something unless it works for your business. But they have even gone so far as just admit that on Azure, which is not Linux based, it's the one cloud that doesn't have any relationship to Linux, but the most the substantial minority, over uh, I believe 35% of their virtual machines on Azure are Linux virtual machines. So Microsoft is in this really odd place where they're supporting Linux on their own systems. Um, and it's making them good money. And uh, it would not surprise me if by say 2019, 2020 at the latest, if Linux was the single most popular virtual machine on um, Azure. Sorry, Windows Server. <laughs> Very interesting. So let's go back to, to your, your, your daily workflow. Um, right. What are some of the tools you use to manage all of, all of the writing? Is it, is it all written in a text editor? Do you have other tools? Do you have list management? Do you have to do, I mean, what are, what are the tangible tools that you rely on to make everything work? I do a lot of making things up as I go along. I keep way too much stuff in my head. Um, but for uh, writing, I use a LibreOffice. And uh, which, um, by the way, folks, if you haven't checked it out because it's not compatible enough with Microsoft Office, check out LibreOffice 6. It has actually made my... Uh, editors who dislike anything except pure Microsoft Office go, oh, well, this, this, these document formats are okay. We can use these. And I go, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, I use Google Calendar to keep uh, the big overview of what I'm doing. I don't use it so much for uh, article assignments or things like that, but I do um, – a lot of business travel, way too much business travel. That's the only way I can keep track of where I'm supposed to be at any given time. Um, I also use Google Docs anymore uh, because a lot of the stuff I write, I, I use a lot of hyperlinks in my story because when someone reads a story of mine, I want them to go to whatever product it is I'm talking about or if I reference something, I want them to go and look at that reference and say, yes, he was right, that is how, I don't know, Kubernetes works here. Um, and uh, Google Docs makes putting hyperlinks in really easy because you can just, uh, you know, highlight a term and uh, automatically pull down the URL for it nine times out of ten. So then that, I mean, it's a small thing, but it saves me time. And... Uh, Gosh, that really is about it. I also rely on instant messaging a lot for that. I usually, these days, I use uh, Game, G-A-I-M, which is a, uh, <laughs> alas, AOL instant messenger may be gone, but uh, it's still, it's a universal client that can work with a lot of different systems. I Most of my people now are on Google Talk or whatever Google is calling their instant messaging system at the moment because I can't keep track of their branding. <laughs> and uh, which makes it really handy. I can talk to pretty much any mate, anyone I need to work with when I need to work with them. Uh, I don't do a lot of video conferencing, but when I do, I usually use Google Hangouts. Um, and... Uh, Still have Skype around, though I don't tend to use it that much. But, you know, there are some offices that have really, it's Skype or nothing for them. So I keep it around for those folks. And, uh, and spoiler alert, Linux works just fine in Skype these days. That's good to know. I was, uh, I was questioning that actually when we were setting this up because I'm, uh, 
I'm talking to you from a Mac, and uh, mm-hmm. I, I use all, all Mac, Windows, Linux on a, on a yeah. relatively mm-hmm. daily basis, although I don't yeah. use Linux desktop as much. I use that for my servers. So yeah. there's, a, there's a bit of a difference there. Speaking of, what is your home tech like? Servers, daily drivers, yeah. IoT, what's the monitor behind you connected to? Oh gosh! Well, the monitor and the the big that monitor there is actually that's a sort of an antique, though it still works. It is a what, what is it? Have to look at the name again. It's a portrait, and it's so named because I don't know if you'll be able to see it or not. You can actually put it into portrait mode. Ah, which back in the day when desktop publishing was the name of the game for people in journalism um, was a big deal yeah. because I was doing a, a lot of stuff in Quark Express. God help me. <laughs> <laughs> <I> <laughs> Profanity uh, still comes to mind whenever I hear that name. Yeah, I still shudder. It was. Uh, I like to say that I can pick up almost any program or operating system in no time. Quark almost killed me, though. That was easily the hardest program I ever had to pick up. And uh, I picked up some doozies in my day. They were also one of the hardest companies to work with. Um, yes, <laughs> that too. I, I lived in Quark for uh, a chunk of, I guess, the 90s. Okay, uh, let's see. What else do I use on a daily basis? Um, well, I have a lot of computers, uh, about, I don't know, a dozen computers. Uh, most of them are Lenovo's and Dell's just because they tend to work well. Uh, on those, I run primarily Linux, but I also run uh, Windows 7 and Windows 10. So I can say intelligent things about Windows 7 and Windows 10. So when, you know, when I am writing about Windows, I, I honestly, I do use them on a daily basis. Uh, not my favorites, but I do use them. So I actually do know what I'm talking about there. Uh, I also run a couple of Macs. Uh, I don't do a lot with them, honestly, but I still have them. Uh, uh, when I go out to work anymore, I've become a big Chromebook fan lately. And I have, uh, well, gosh, maybe half a dozen Chromebooks, of various generations. And uh, I... My favorite at the moment, though, is the Pixelbook. I just got the newest high-end i7 Pixelbook, uh, which for a ridiculous amount of money, but it's really spiffy. And also, you can use a high-end Chromebook anyway to also run you know, Linux on at the same time, and I do a lot of that. That way, uh, I can do all my usual work can be done on a Chromebook because, you know, what do I do? Read, write, and research. But when I knew need image processing, I use GIMP, and which I run on a using Ubuntu on top of uh, my Chromebooks, and it works really well for me. So, is it running as a, a virtual app, or are you dual booting Chromebook and um, and Linux? I'm running them simultaneously, and you can uh, because Chrome OS actually is Linux based. Right. And so I run it in a uh, cheroot, uh, sort of a really primitive idea of a container, and they run simultaneously, and I can copy and paste between them. Uh, read all about it in a couple of my stories on how to <laughs> to do it. Actually, I should do another one on it because it's changed around recently, and I don't think the current stuff I have up, uh, out there anymore is up to date. But it... Uh, it works really well. It might not work for anybody else, but then again, like I said a couple of times, I really do operating systems. So the idea of simultaneously running a pair of operating systems doesn't phase me in the yeah. least. So um, it sounds like you've got like maybe a ring going on back there, or some other IoT things going on. Do you uh, yeah, do, do you subscribe to the uh, to the home automation world? And if so, what do you, what do you, what have you plugged in, and and what does it mean? Well. Uh, I'm really rather nervous about the Internet of Things. Uh, I think it's – actually, I don't fake. I know it's way insecure. We've done a lousy job. The, the vendors have done a lousy job of securing this stuff. You know, that said, I do have a Google uh, Google Home, which I really like. 
I have an Amazon Echo, which I'm not as crazy about, uh, but I use them basically as smart radios and get the weather. Uh, works for me. Uh, I also have a bunch of servers here. Uh, I also have some servers at a co-location, co-location, and uh, that's on the co-location sites is where I run my websites. Uh, and uh, But I still keep actual physical servers around here because at the end of the day, I uh, still like getting my hands dirty with the stuff. And I want to actually have the hardware here and fiddle with it with whatever operating system I want to play with rather than whatever version of usually CentOS um, I'm stuck with with the uh, my co-host. Uh, I've also got virtual machines on cl every cloud you can name. Uh, again, this is really all so I can keep my hands in and so that when... I need to say something intelligent about cloud programs, I'm able to do so. Uh, again, it's not for everybody, but it works for me. <laughs> so do you um, do you think that we're going to go to a point where, where most IT operations are pretty much all cloud infrastructure versus on-prem, or do you think we're going to still be you know, for years into the future, not outside of, let's say, government and high security places? Right. Um, we're, we're going to still be, um, a mix of hybrid on cloud and, and, and on-prem and on cloud. I think we're heading really quickly to a cloud, uh, IT universe. You know, cloud is something else that I cover pretty extensively along with, uh, DevOps and, uh, container orchestration and all that good stuff. And, um, uh, you know, the bottom line is, uh, not that the technology is so cool or so spiffy, but it saves money. And it's just a lot cheaper if you're not running the machine, the hardware yourself. Uh, and as the tools get easier, the uh, higher level automation tools get easier to use. Um, it just makes it really easy to run a lot of servers that you don't have to pay for except when you're using them. And um, it just makes financial sense. It's good for the bottom line. Um, Kubernetes, for example, I've been writing a lot about, it's going to revolutionize things. So Kubernetes will let people really do hybrid cloud the way they want to. I think they want to do hybrid cloud, which is they've got some workloads here, they've got some workloads there, and they can shift them about relatively easy, easily if you have a Kubernetes uh, orchestrating the entire thing, because Kubernetes doesn't care where those workloads are. It can shift them from cloud to cloud if need be. It's, that's still, you know, it's still a little work now, but it, it is coming. And uh, again, you know, bottom line is the, the the financial realities will make sure that the cloud succeeds. I mean, there will still be some people who insist upon having their own hardware, but uh, I think as time goes on, it's going to be increasingly more hobbyist rather than people who are actually running uh, their businesses there. As for the actual model we'll take, I think it's still going to be, I think it'll be a hybrid model because, uh, you know, it's really nice if you can put everything in the kitchen sink on Amazon, but do you really trust AWS or Google Cloud or Azure with everything? I don't think so. I think people are still going to want to keep at least some stuff at home and then do like cloud bursting, which is when you suddenly you've got too much for your private cloud, your, uh, whether it's in your office or a data center somewhere, and you just ship out the excess work over to the public cloud. Um, I think there'll be less of that. I think in-house will become smaller and smaller, but I think the small data centers will, they'll still be in business. So you've you've mentioned Kubernetes a bunch of times, um, right. and in some ways it's 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 a little Docker esque but different. Um, right. 
when I first wanted to understand Docker, I turned to you and said, hey, Stephen, don't you think we need an article? And, and right. then I learned about Docker. So how do, where, what's the difference between the two and where does Kubernetes fit and where does Docker fit? Uh, uh, Docker is a container technology, which is, uh, it's hardly the first one. Containers have actually been around forever and a day. But they're essentially, they, you run an operating system and on that operating system, you, have, you run just enough to run a server application or whatever. Now it sounds something like a virtual machine and it is a bit like a virtual machine, but with a virtual machine, you have to run the whole shebang. You've got everything in, on hardware, emulated in software. There's actually, that's one model of virtualization. There are others, but we'll just go, go too deep down that rabbit hole. Containers though let you run application or usually a single application in a much smaller space. So it saves you money. If you are running servers, um, you, if you have a lot of resources that are usually going to waste because we're frankly not fast enough to really use our computers uh, as effectively as we would like to. So instead we run multiple applications using multiple virtual machines. Content, though one server will say it runs free virtual machines. That gives you the power of free servers in one. Containers gives you even more of that. Let's say you can run nine containers, nine instances of say the Apache web server and MySQL and whatever application is you want. Now you're running nine server applications on one piece of hardware. That saves real money. But now, how do you manage, though, all those containers? I mean, that's a lot of stuff to keep track of. And containers also, they tend to come up, they go down. It's not like, you know, you run the operating system and the machine runs 24-7 forever in a day. Containers you run just as you need them. They come, they go, uh, all depending on what the load is. So how do you orchestrate that? How do you manage that? And the answer is Kubernetes. So Kubernetes is, uh, people usually call it a cloud orchestration program, and I do that as well, but a better way, a better description is actually a cloud container choreo choreographer, because it just sort of choreographs, okay, you run here, you run there, and I'll let the human on the other end of all this know what's going on. And oh, by the way, if we need to move these things from here to there because that server is getting overloaded, okay, I will automate that process for you. So I will shift these containers from one place to another in a smooth, easy fashion that you don't need to worry about. So it's another layer of abstraction. It is Kubernetes is to containers, technologies like Docker, what uh, DevOps programs are to virtual machines and physical servers. They're an abstract way of managing them, which makes it much simpler and easier to do. Got it. Cool. So you are extremely active on social networks, and I've always been curious, how do you keep up with all of that? Are you using any kind of tools, or you just dive in every day and, and, and work hard? Well, I, I really wish I knew a, t a social networking tool I really liked. Uh, folks, I'm easy to find. I'm, my email address is easy to find. If you've got something that can manage Facebook, Twitter, Google+, and let's throw LinkedIn on top of that. Let me know. <laughs> I would love to know because right now what I'm doing is I'm going to each one uh, multiple times a day to uh, quickly read stuff and enter stuff. And it does take up a lot of time. Um, fortunately, I'm very fast again. Um, I like to say that I may not be the best writer out there, but I'm faster than all the writers who are better than I am, and I'm better than all the writers who are still faster than I am. So, <laughs> but still, it eats up a lot of time, though. Is it worth it? I mean, you're you're um, posting and retweeting and and right. and following all of this stuff. Is it worth that right. amount of time to you? It is. Uh, I'm. Again, I've been in this business now for about 30 years, and uh, 
one reason, and I've always been employed one way or the other, which isn't to say I haven't been let go because I have, in technology journalism, for those of you who don't know, there is no such thing as job security. Uh, work is always coming and going. And I figured out a long time ago uh, it would help if my name was out there and people knew who I was. And one way to do that is social networking. It certainly also helps that, uh, well, in my personal life, I'm not really that social, but put me online and I'll chat with anybody. Um, so I enjoy being chattery online. And uh, so that also works for me as well. Uh, and in, so in terms of just pure business, uh, though, it also has helped me a lot. My uh, stories tend to get read a lot more than stories by other people, uh, which in turn means I make, I'm very successful as a technology journalist. And I know a lot of people who really struggle in my business and I'm doing, uh, you know, quite well at it. And uh, I, I know for a fact that it's in large part because of social networking. Got it. So, so sometimes we, we, we kind of think of social networking as a bit of a pox, and other times we rely on it to right. to drive our, our income. Um, I use uh, – I looked at a whole bunch of social networking tools from Hootsuite to Buffer to right. a ton of others, and I didn't right. find any of them that was particularly good, although I, I tend to use the free Buffer to just right. sort of send things out because I might look at it at an odd time or something right. like that. Um, so you're really finding that the time investment you're putting into social networking from yeah. a professional point of view, not from a personal, I want to get political, but from a professional sort right. of promotional point of view is, is, is a value to you. It is absolutely no question. It's a great value to me. Uh, I know a, a, a lot of people in our business, uh, don't find it that way. They find it a real chore and a real annoyance. Uh, I think it helps that if you are sort of a uh, online extrovert, that helps for you a lot. Uh, writers and journalists tend to be pure introverts, though, so it's difficult for them. I know that's also a problem with some uh, technology and programmers, for that matter. They might want to talk about their ideas more on, in their case, it's usually IRC or our technology mailing list, but they, they feel sort of intimidated, so they just don't say that much. And that can be problematic for some of them. I think they would also find their careers might benefit if they could just, you know, put themselves out there a little bit more on whatever their particular IRC channel is or something like, say, Spiceworks, which is a uh, sort of a social news network for developers, particularly Microsoft developers, but you know, more than just that. And how do people separate the signal from the noise? You know, I mean, watching Twitter feeds or Facebook feeds or uh, and all of that is is that where you just sort of dip in and dip out on whenever you feel like it, or is it more of a a rigor that you follow? Oh, uh, it's sort of a rigor. You also you develop an eye for it if you do enough of it, um, and so if you just if you read a lot of it. Uh, Eventually, you can spot it when things are starting to go wrong. You can just ignore it. Uh, it's not easy, though. I, I will say that you know separating the uh, chaff from the wheat is not easy. You know, one of the reasons, actually, why I like Google Plus, which uh, attention, folks, Google Plus is not dead. It's still alive. It's actually very good. Actually, we've had this discussion, Plus. haven't we, a couple times now. <laughs> yeah, it's been declared dead a couple of times, and guess what? It's still not, and actually it's very good if you want to know what really is going on. If you don't want to follow the Linux kernel mailing list because Patches makes your eyes glaze over, um, you'll find that Linus Torvalds and Greg KH and a lot of the other movers and shakers of the Linux universe, that's where they live. <laughs> so it's very handy for me, and a lot of other uh, serious technology people are still on there. Um, so anyway, Google Plus can be very handy. And though I, I remember now, the reason I was mentioning in particular, though, is for Google Plus makes it really easy that if someone is like constantly trolling you or trying to give you crap, you just block them forever. It's really easy and they can't get to you. They can't 
try, you know, unless they want to create yet a new identity. Um, and it's difficult to do that on Google Plus. It's, um, you know, it just makes it really easy to get rid of the uh, nattering, nonsensical idiots that you don't want to ever see anything from ever again. So you write a lot about religion. Um, and right. by religion, you know, obviously I'm talking about Linux and Microsoft and, and other technologies. Mm -hmm. Have you seen uh, any increase or decrease in, in the troll level? Is it a problem for you? Are you managing it? Uh, well, first, uh, a lesson that most technology writers know is never read the comments. <laughs> uh, I'm, I, you know, I used to talk to everybody and anybody who would write to me about my stories, but I've learned that a lot of them are just trolls, and so I, I just ignore them or delete them. Life is too short, and so I just don't let them bother me anymore. But I do find it kind of funny that I hear well, the Linux people now say I'm too pro Microsoft, and the uh, Windows or Die people still tell me that I'm just, I just ignore it. That's really the only way to do it. Just ignore it. If possible, just get rid of them. The trolling seems to have gone down some. Uh, maybe they've all become troll Trump supporters. I don't know. <laughs> Interesting. Well, we're we're going to avoid that completely. Yeah, let's not go there. Um, and instead, I'm going to ask you about things. You mentioned social life so, and, and personal life. Let's talk about work-life balance. What do you do right. for fun? What are, you, what are you passionate about? What are you binge watching right now? Been watching right now. Uh, well, uh, NBC's uh, The Good Life. If you have not seen it, see it. It is a wonderful half hour comedy about all kinds of things, including Immanuel Kant and Soren Kierkegaard and other deep philosophical stuff, uh, the trolley problem. And it's also just as funny and as cleverly written as All Get Out. You may not have recognized any of those names, Kant or Kierkegaard. Trust me, you don't have to. Hey, I went to engineering school, so I don't have to. You don't have to, but watch the show. <laughs> Seriously, start with season one because you got to watch the first season because it's – anyway, it's great. It just ended the second season. Um Let's see what else. Uh, there's a Netflix show called Travelers, which unfortunately I'm um, at the end of the second season and all hell is breaking loose. Uh, and we don't know until next January. I don't know what's going to happen with that. Uh, it's a science fiction story uh, about people who are time travelers who come back, a lot of them all trying to change the current times, though their disastrous future won't happen. Now, obviously, there's a problem there because if they change the future, well, where did they come from in the first place? Well, they actually they deal with that question. But the interesting thing about this is that it takes it all very seriously, and it's really clever how they do things. Um, I really recommend that show. Uh, Eric McCormick, which some people know from Will and Grace, actually plays a serious dramatic role in it, and he's really very good. Um, so I watch too much TV for my own good. Uh, I also read a lot. Uh, I'm a serious theater person. Uh, try to make it up to New York to do some Broadway every year. Uh, and uh, when I lived in Washington, D.C., I had season tickets for pretty much every major theater in town, from the Woolly Mammoth to Arena Stage to the Kennedy Center to uh, the Shakespeare Theater, you name it, I watched it. Uh, I also listen a lot to music. Uh, my dad was a record and tape wholesaler, and I had the best rock and roll LP collection of the 60s of anybody because I got it all, got a hold of all the stuff first. I was. <laughs> You know, open up the box and go, oh, there's the New Rolling Stones. I'll just, bet there were jealous right. friends a lot, weren't there? <laughs> there were. And um, so I really like a lot of music. I go to a fair number of concerts still. I wish I could do anything with music. I can't. <laughs> How well. These hands are great on a typewriter keyboard. Put them on a piano keyboard, and it's a different story. 
Well, that's uh, that's that's awesome. Um, is there anything else you want to tell people before we start wrapping this stuff up? Anything I should have asked? Uh, any insights that you want to share? Oh gosh, insights to share. Um, advice to give. Advice to give. Um, well, don't get too religious about technology. Uh, we were mentioned that earlier. I mean, I use Linux and all that because it really it really works well. But I've never let that stop me from, you know, I, I mentioned Azure earlier, actually, you know, all props to LibreOffice and Calc, which is its version of Excel. But really, if you want to do serious spreadsheeting, Microsoft Excel for about 20 years now, at least, is the program to use. And these, and these fingers here, again, they started on Visa Calc. So, uh, so don't be religious about it. Uh, don't be afraid to explore things. Uh, what else? Oh, read my stories. <laughs> Definitely. Speaking of, where can folks find you online? I mean, I've been uh, running little little tickers with your 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 Twitter and and the ZDNet locations, but where else can people find you online? Oh gosh, well, uh, my stories are found on ZDNet, Computer World. Uh, HPE and uh, DXC both publish some of my more technical stories, where again, I'm not talking about HPE products or DXC services. I'm talking about the actual technologies. Uh, so look for me there. Um, the easiest way to keep track of what I'm writing, because I always promote it on social networking, is find me on Google+. Um, I've got that really long, odd last name. I'm not hard to find. I also go by the acronym SJVN. Uh, but if you follow me on Google+, Plus, you'll see pretty much everything I write, along with the occasional dumb cartoon. Um, and that's the easiest way to keep track of me. Cool. Well, Stephen, I have wanted to have this chat with you for a very, very long time. Um as I've said, you've been a role model for, for me for years, and I love reading your stuff, and I learn a tremendous amount from, from the articles you write and occasionally beg you to write articles on topics I need to understand. Okay. So I want to thank you, uh, and on behalf of also our readers, I want to thank you. So thanks very much for taking the time. Very much my pleasure. You take care, all. <laughs>